So in earlier sessions, we've talked in general about this kind of cyclic cycle of stellar evolution where we have giant molecular clouds uh, collapse under gravity and start to form clusters of stars during those main sequence phases. And in later phases, they're fusing heavier and heavier elements. Stars eventually die, giving off a lot of their material as planetary nebulas or explosions. And then we have these dead stars, white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes that are left behind. But we were also saying that those previously ejected materials, the planetary nebulas, the supernova events that eject a lot of that now enriched material, we said that that mixes back in with other molecular clouds and starts forming new generations of stars. So what we want to talk about in this session is go into a little bit more detail about the role that the galaxy itself plays in this cyclic process of stellar evolution. So we have this process called the star gas star cycle. And this is going to be the process where we look at the details in how we go from these ejected materials during the uh, planetary nebula phases and the supernova phases of a the end of a star's life, and how that goes through a bunch of different steps where we have these hot bubbles of gas that are being ejected in the uh, in the interstellar material, how that eventually turns into the atomic hydrogen layer, that thicker layer of higher temperature gas, eventually settles down to the middle, that cooler cloud of molecular hydrogen gas, and then is now primed for new generations of star formation. So we're going to be looking more at how the galaxy itself plays a role in this cyclic process. So after we have these, uh, the stars go through their lives, they're forming heavier elements in their cores. And then we have things like supernovas, uh, 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 planetary nebulas, and these strong solar winds that are kind of pushing the outer layers of the star off and allowing that now enriched material to expand outwards. Well, there are going to be some additional steps in allowing that to eventually cool back down and mix into new gas clouds. Because let's say I had a supernova go off. Some star, it's just an isolated star in the middle of a vast emptiness of space. That star goes off as a supernova and violently ejects its material away. Well, if that was all that happened, then that material that's being ejected, sometimes at are up to like 10% the speed of light, that material is never really going to, you know, recoalesce. The supernova event has ejected that material off with enough velocity that that material will never recombine on its own. And again, this is where the rest of the galaxy is going to come into play. So... When we're talking about these hot bubbles, those thin high temperature gases, sometimes extremely high temperature gases given off by things like the stellar winds, uh, planetary nebula and supernovas, eventually start running into other parts of the interstellar medium and making these shock waves. So these shock waves that are actually produced in the interstellar medium by these events this is what we call the hot bubbles. So what's going on in detail here? As I said, if we just had a star in empty space ejecting its outer layers, either as a planetary nebula or a supernova, those materials, if it was just one star and nothing else around it, that material would never recollapse. But if this is happening inside of the disk of a galaxy. So for example, for our Milky Way galaxy, we have this disk of material where maybe one of the stars in here, or maybe a few of the stars in here, explodes as a supernova. So it ejects the outer layers of that star. Well, this ejected material, it's going to start running in to some of those other clouds of gas and dust in the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. Stars are small compared to the space around them. So the stars are not really going to be able to block the path of the gases that are moving up. It'll basically just go right around those stars really easily. 
However, these large clouds of dust and gas, that's going to get in the way of these expelled gases. And it's going to cause them to start to slow down. So it causes these things to slow down. And maybe we have enough force to start to push those gases a little bit out of the disc, disc of the galaxy. But it's going to use up a lot of its energy just kind of trying to push that colder material away. And that will slow it down enough that these materials, even if we get some of these giant bubbles coming off, those materials are moving slowly enough and the gravitational attraction to the rest of the disk of that galaxy is going to be enough to keep those gases captured. They won't just explode off and move into, you know, be completely ejected from the galaxy itself. So the fact that those shock waves have to move through all of that colder gas, it's going to slow that those shock waves down and allow the gravitational pull of the rest of the disk to recapture those gases. If we didn't have this disk of material that is gas rich, it wouldn't be able to block those expanding shock waves. And we're actually going to see in a future session how galaxies that don't have this kind of a gas rich disk, those kinds of galaxies aren't going to be able to recapture those gases. And those types of galaxies are going to have very different properties and not show signs of new star formation. So again, the material that's ejected by these supernova and stellar, stellar winds, when those materials run into the interstellar medium, they can make these hot bubbles, but it still has slowed those gases down enough to start recapturing those gases. So the hot gases cool down and eventually rain back down onto the disk. And then notice this is both going to be above and below the disk that this is happening. These ejected material are basically going to rain back down onto the disk and allow that remixing of material and allow that now enriched material to be used to form new generations of stars. So again, this disk collects material that would otherwise have been dispersed. Well, what kind of layers is this going to make? Well, these newly ejected, uh, uh, these partially ejected gases that are raining back down into the disk, they're going to start in that atomic hydrogen layer. That thicker layer that has moderately high temperatures and uh, moderate densities. We talked about this in the session when we were talking about the structure of our Milky Way galaxy. We can see those atomic hydrogen lines using uh, that atomic hydrogen using that 21 centimeter line. And here we have a picture of the Andromeda galaxy in the visible spectrum and the Andromeda galaxy looking at it with that 21 centimeter line, specifically looking at the atomic hydrogen. So again, we notice that that atomic hydrogen is uh, pretty much confined to a thicker band in this disk. And again, that material from exploding stars is recaptured and falls back down onto this cloud of uh, atomic hydrogen. The molecular clouds, well, we said that those are significantly colder in a significantly thinner layer of the disk. So as things cool off, they'll generally settle to the center of the disk. And those gases will be colder and denser and more primed for new star formation. So let me resize this. So the materials in these outer layers are going to be higher temp. Uh, higher temp and lower density. And as the material cools, that material is going to start settling to the middle. And then we get that molecular uh, hydrogen band. It's colder and denser. Okay. 
again, this one up here was the uh, atomic hydrogen. Again, that interstellar material, uh, that interstellar medium, as it cools, it will generally settle to that middle layer of the Milky Way disk. And that is where material is now primed for new generations of star formation. Also, the supernovas that have been going off, if we have this colder material in here, when these supernovas go off, we said that in order to initiate star formation, we have these giant molecular clouds and something needs to give it initial, an initial little push to start those gases compressing. Well, some of these supernovas, the parts of the shockwave that go this way, they can actually take some of those gases and compress them just enough to allow star formation to start to occur. It allows those clouds to start to collapse. We've talked about the composition of different clouds of gas and dust in the interstellar medium and the compositions of stars. We said it's usually three quarters hydrogen, one quarter helium, 2% heavier stuff. And again, that 2% heavier stuff is formed during stellar lives and during the supernova events, and then mixed in to the rest of the uh, gas in the interstellar material, and eventually makes new generations of stars that now have some of those heavier elements. Well, if this is where that those heavy elements came from, then earlier generations of stars should not have gone through this cycle as much and should not have as many of these heavier elements. We, in the last session, we talked about globular clusters and said in these globular clusters, there are stars where the percentage of heavy elements is only about 0.02%, significantly lower than the uh, percentage of heavy elements that we see in stars within the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. And when we talk about star uh, galaxy formation, we're going to see how this is a strong sign that these may have formed before the disk of our galaxy, before we've actually gone through this star gas star cycle repeatedly to generate more and more of those heavy elements. In fact, in very, very distant objects, objects that were formed very, very early on in the history of the universe, there are some objects that we've detected that have less than one two hundred thousandth the heavy element abundance as the sun. So when we see these kinds of objects that have very, very low abundances of heavy elements, we can be we can use that to say these objects must be very, very old. They must have formed before this star gas star cycle uh, had a chance to produce many of those heavier elements. In the first generations of stars, we expect that the first generations of stars only contained hydrogen and helium and nothing else. One of the things that the James Webb Space Telescope is designed to specifically study are those very, very distant objects. And hopefully we'll be able to learn more about these first generations of stars that presumably only had hydrogen and helium. Because again, stellar evolution and the life cycles depend a little bit on how much heavy elements we have. So we want to learn more about this first generation of stars that were the first to actually produce more and more of these heavy elements. So let's kind of think of this as a, uh, as a kind of discussion question. Um, given what we know about stellar evolution cycle and the star gas star cycle, think about in 50 billion years, Again, our galaxy is only around 12 billion years old. The universe is around 13.8 billion years. So 50 billion years is a long time down the road. In, in 50 billion years, what kind of stars might we see today? Like how many stars? What are the spectral types of stars that we might see a lot of? Um, and what will the interstellar medium be like? So the amount of gas, the percentage of heavy elements, uh, Pause the video here and have a think through what sort of things we would expect to see if our universe was much, much older. So pause the video and have a go at that.
Okay, so let's try discussing this a bit. And again, if you haven't done so yet, try making some predictions yourself and seeing how they compare with uh, what we're going to be discussing here. So if we keep on going through this cycle, generating more and more heavy elements, we clearly have this method of turning hydrogen and helium into heavier elements, but there isn't really a large scale way of turning those heavy elements back into hydrogen, at least on larger scales, um, naturally occurring on larger, larger scales. So the amount of heavy elements, the percentage of heavy elements is probably going to continue to go up. So uh, say in 50 billion years, 50 gig years, percentage of heavy elements will increase. So that's one thing that's probably going to happen. As we go through the star gas star cycle, these, this cycle, there are still some different dead stars that are going to be left over. Things like white dwarfs, neutron stars, black holes. For white dwarfs, if it's got a companion star, it can potentially gather more mass, go through those white dwarf supernovas and eject that material. But a lot of those dead stars are just going to kind of stick there doing nothing. So we're probably going to see more and more of those dead stars. So we have larger numbers of dead stars. And every time we go through this star gas star cycle, during star formation, we make stars of a variety of different masses, but which ones do we make in greater numbers? The high mass stars or the low mass stars? Which ones are produced in greater numbers? Yeah, we produce low mass stars in much greater numbers and they last much longer. So there's probably going to be more and more of those very low mass stars sticking around. So we have larger numbers of dead stars and low mass stars. Well, if a lot of the material in the galaxy is starting to be kind of locked up in these dead stars, these low mass stars, a lot of uh, brown dwarfs are also going to be produced. If all that material ends up being locked up in those stars and doesn't get recycled back in, we're gonna have lower amounts of gas and dust. So lower amounts of gas, Again, primarily just because more and more of that material that we have to work with is locked up in these dead star cores and in these low mass stars. So we're going to have lower amounts of gas. And if there's lower amounts of gas, what can we say about the prospects of future star formation? If there's lower amounts of gas, well, we're not going to have much new star formation. So lower amounts of star formation. So these low mass stars, we're talking about, uh, you know, K and M stars, uh, brown dwarfs, you know, things like that. Those are going to dominate, but we're not going to see very many O and B main sequence stars because again, those die off pretty quickly after they're formed. And if all of that gas is eventually being caught up in these dead star cores and these low mass stars, there's not going to be much new star formation to replenish those numbers of O and B main sequence stars. So this is kind of a quick little overview of where this star gas star cycle might lead. It won't continue on you know, indefinitely because of how some of this gas gets locked up in some of these other stars. And the fact that these abundances of heavy elements are only going to go up. So again, we eventually 
in much, much longer times, we might even eventually run out of hydrogen helium to actually get those uh, stars to begin their life cycles. Because at the beginning of these star life cycles, we're mostly using uh, we're mostly using the hydrogen and that hydrogen fusion to get these stars started. So that's kind of the overview of uh, what's going to happen with the star gas star cycle. And we're going to use this star gas star cycle and see how does this affect the different kinds of galaxies that we see. So far, we've just talked about the Milky Way galaxy, our nice spiral galaxy, but there are different kinds of galaxies. And depending on their properties, they might allow this cycle to go more efficiently or basically stop this cycle. So we're going to be talking about that in future sessions.